it is my pristine honor to be able to bring forward for everybody, Dr. Jane Brunt. So she's not just a vet, which that is an amazing calling as it is, but Dr. Jane has done a great deal in her career to really advance cat health. Um, first and foremost, she is the executive director for an organization called the Catalyst Council. And it's about bringing organizations together to really advance the betterment of overall for cat health. She owns her own hospital, which is called the Cat Hospital of Townsend, and it's actually short for CHAT, which I think is phenomenal. And it was the very first cat only or cat exclusive hospital in Maryland. She's got a ton of other great things that I'm sure she's going to brag about as we go through this. And we'll be citing some sources tonight from something called the AAFP, and that is the American Association of Feline Practitioners. Did I say that right? Did I say that one right? Yes, I did. I always wonder if I got the association in the right place. Um, so if you see AAFP.org in here, you know they are the foremost authorities when it comes to information specifically uh, regarding cat health. So everyone, please raise your glass. And we're going to start off with an incredible toast from our very own Dr. Jane. Ah, oh, Catherine, thank you so much. And I'm so glad you mentioned the Catalyst Council because we work with so many other animal health and welfare organizations, including the Bridge Club. Um, and we focus on, like you do, sort of the intersection of evidence and emotion. So in other words, what we do is promote what's proven by science to be best for cats, framed in kind of a compelling way to cause cat parents to do what's best for their cats. And since Catalyst Council has designated this very month as Happy Cat Month, I would like us to toast to think about how we will consider each cat as a unique individual, because we can make them happy and healthy by meeting their needs as cats. Um, we will honor the human cat bond, especially in this pandemic pandemonium that's going on, right? And so here's to celebrating our cats because they do so much for us. So let's talk about what we can do for them. Cheers, everybody. I like that it's Happy Cat Monk. That makes me happy. Mm -hmm. So guys, I'm gonna launch a poll. And we are going to start diving into questions, just some two simple questions we'd like to help answer. And then we will end up quizzing Dr. Jane as to what she thinks those answers look like, because uh -oh. that's what makes it kind of fun. See if she can stay on top of it and does she kind of know you all, but it helps us as we're going into this conversation. So I guess one of the things that I find to be one of the biggest questions that when we're on Facebook and we do Happy Cat Month, and if someone brings up the idea that, hey, take your cat to the vet, things like that, and people go, do I really need, do I really, really need to take my cat to the vet for preventive care? They're fine, eating good, poops look good. Do I really need to be taking them in? And that's for you, Dr. Jane. Ah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're the guest. Thank you. <laughs> well, sure. Well, of course. I mean, that's a rhetorical question, right? So, yes, uh, there is so much that they're not telling us and that we can't see. I mean, if you think about the animal analogy of a hippopotamus in murky water, right? All you see are these two holes sticking above the surface of the water, and there is so much underneath the surface. Well, cats are not small hippopotamuses or hippopotami, just like they're not small dogs or small people. But what's important is that we need to check them out below the surface and look for the common conditions that we know that they get. So we need to look at oral health. You know that two thirds of cats by the age of three have some kind of oral disease, periodontal disease, tartar, even resorptive lesions. That's a young cat, right? Wow. Um, weight, their optimal weight, because more than 50% of cats that we see are overweight or obese. And joint health. Uh, before we actually started, we were talking about um, arthroscopy in cats and that kind of thing, because mostly that's a dog thing. But 90% of cats over the age of 11 have some evidence of arthritis on x-rays. So those conditions are really common, but also GI conditions, diabetes, kidney and lower urinary tract conditions, thyroid disease, all kinds of cancers, 
all of that. And even hypertension, high blood pressure is something that cats get. So even if they're 100% indoor, indoors, and I will um, even say, especially if they're 100% indoors. So um, the good news, the good news is that we can prevent, um, treat, and even better yet to, to prevent them. So so let's yes. bring it, let's, can we talk about this indoor outdoor cat thing? Because I yeah. do think what is interesting is, you know, uh, when you do go into your veterinarian in which we do hope everyone has a very solid relationship with their veterinarian, but we hear about vaccines. We hear about getting, you know, other, uh, parasiticide protection, but you're like, Hey, a cat's inside. So why do I have to go and do those types, uh, types of things? I think it's really, that's probably when it, and maybe I'm wrong, so correct me, but is that one of the biggest misconceptions is that just because they're indoor, they don't need all those extra? I mean, when you think about all those things I mentioned, they're independent of being indoors, outdoors. But that indoors cat um, perspective, a third of people, 36% in a recent Royal Canin uh, survey of 2000 cat owners, 36% didn't think their indoor cat needed to go to the veterinarian for checkups. So um, they do because of all those reasons, but that, you know, vaccinations and dewormings, well, you know, parasites, they can uh, hitchhike indoors. Fleas carry um, the infectious bacterium that causes cat scratch disease. So flea control is super important. Uh, soil and potted plants has, has um, parasite eggs in it. And heartworms are spread by mosquitoes and there's no such thing. I like to tell my clients that there's no such thing as an outdoors only mosquito. So um, in Maryland where I live, uh, heartworm are endemic. So it's really important for cats to be on preventive because you can't treat it once they get it. Um, and heartworm disease is lung disease. So that's, a, that's something I wanna mention maybe a little later um, with coughing and hacking and, and, and that kind of thing. So, um, and then for vaccinations, of course, rabies is everywhere and cats um, are the most common domestic animal to be infected by rabies. Are they really? I didn't know that. Yeah, so oh. depending on the state, depending on when, where you are, um, it's reportable. So you can look up where rabies, how many cases of rabies are reported in a year through the state health departments and they, of course, there's skunk and bats and rab and um, foxes, um, but then also wildlife is um, agriculture animals can be you know any warm blooded animal can get infected, but cats are the most common of domestic animals that get infected. And so one of the things I do want to mention. So I'm gonna I am gonna I am a really an advocate for parasite uh, control. It's such a big deal, and well, I find it very interesting. I always say to someone, how, how often a year do you find a mosquito in your house in the winter when you're like, where the heck did that one come from? And so I always <laughs> go, JJ's like, yep, totally happens. So I always think to myself that that little sucker can sneak through, you know, when you least expect it and you're like, what is happening? I'm a big proponent of it because it, it can absolutely be deadly and so I'm just going to give my little mosquito thing on that one. I'm a big, big, big believer in, in yeah. uh, taking care of yeah. your pets from that perspective. Yeah. So probably one of the ones we are going to, we're going to get some, yes, I see Zach. Yes, we can ask lots of behavior questions too, uh, as we're going through. So bring those on, but I do want to talk about what they eat. So cats are you know, interesting and finicky, hence the reason why they're finicky cats. Um, but can we talk a little bit about nutrition and why that's so important? Like in every stage of their life, you can't just pick one thing and then go, I'm good. Yes, yes. Even though you'll see labels that say uh, suitable for cats and kittens. And that's when anyone can make a pet food that meets AFCO, the American Association of Feeding, I forget. Um, <laughs> guidelines. Yes, they but, have lots of names. Right. But if you think about life stages with kittenhood, it's really important to start with the essential nutrients that they need for growth and energy to make sure they have the proper calcium and phosphorus ratio. But those needs change. Uh, when that kitten becomes a juvenile and when they're spayed and neutered, then those needs change. Um, so it's important 
I think the most important visit actually is when a kitten is becomes nine or 10 months of age. Oh. Talk about that on preventive care, but, but um, then when they're an adult and eventually a senior, and if we're lucky, super seniors, how many super seniors, how many hands? Oh yeah, how many we got in here? Super senior cats. I can, of, of the 60 people here, I can see a handful and I see some hands, so thank so you. So what considers a super senior? What is the age? Yeah, they're, they're like 15. And that's pretty common. Okay. Um, so they're, they're senior at seven or eight, and then they're um, certainly by their time they're in double digits. And those have, they, they have different needs. And that's the age when we also start to see changes in their other organ systems where a therapeutic diet might be needed for that cat. Say it has had, well, in middle age, say they've had crystals in their urine, which if you don't check a urine periodically uh, to find out that they do have a high urine pH and crystals in their urine, they could block. We have had two cats block in the past five days that were eating um, dry grocery store food from a you know good company and they blocked. Um, so in both cases, um, that could have been prevented by the preventive care, checking a urinalysis, and then making sure that that cat is on the right food for them. So now there are therapeutic diets to treat them, as there are with diabetes and kidney disease and even thyroid disease. So that's why every patient's an individual, every cat has its own lifestyle, its own medical condition, and that's why that exam is so important. So when uh, everyone knows, I love actually giving pet owners tips or pet parents tips. So you said, check the urine. What can we look for in the urine that would be a good clue to us that it's time for a full urinalysis that we should be getting them in? Well, I have a question for you, Catherine. How often do you look at your cat's urine and how would you look at it? So if the, if the litter box is in the other room and not often, Unless yeah. you're it, it that. Forms that's a clump. the point, right? Yeah. It forms a clump. So, so bes the bigger picture of looking at cat's urine is looking at how many clumps, how frequently, how big are the clumps, how, what's the volume of the urine. So those are clues that if you, if you understand your cat early and watch it, um, you know what's normal for your cat. That's always a huge help. But um, as far as looking at the urine itself, actually there is a new urine um, indicator for blood that Royal Canin has available or will have available that actually um, that will turn a color if there's blood in the urine. There shouldn't be oh. red blood cells in the urine. That the, the pet says, parents can use? They won't, yeah. or does that, oh wow, that's yeah. incredible. Uh -huh. It's called Blue Care. Oh. Blue Care. So I got us a little off on the nutrition. I did not mean yeah, to. Yeah, that's I all right. Wanna, I, I get a little excited when I hear stuff and I'm like, oh my gosh. So can we, what is, how do we know what is the best food for our cat? Well, you know, every cat's an individual. So you have to think what's best for my cat and be like a scientist. So instead of just meeting those guidelines, ask what companies do research um, to make sure that their food is safe and health for the various formulations. Another good question to ask is, well, how many credentialed animal nutritionists do they have um, on their staff or do they employ? Oh, that's great. A really important thing is what are the quality control processes for their ingredients and for their manufacturing and um, distribution process? Because everything should be tested for content and purity to make sure it's effective and safe. Would that be on the food care. label or is that like in the, like, or is that something that like AFP would have? How do you find all that information out to find out like how many nutrition? Yeah, I mean, there are, there are um, curated sites. I'm not sure that FP, which is catvets.com, by the way, catvets.com, um, would have like these companies do this. That's why it takes a little investigating. I will say now it's wonderful that every food has to be stamped with the calorie count content in that, in a cup or in the can or the package or whatever. It's teeny tiny. It's like you need a little magnifying glass just to see how many kilocalories are in a can. But that's a really huge, important thing to count the calories and to make sure your cat's getting the right number of calories for its 
um, individual needs and your veterinarian can help you do that. I think that's awesome. So now quiz time on you, Dr. Jane. So of the folks that are here, we'll just do percentages. How of what percent of the people here do you think take their cat to the vet at least yearly? Of the people here? Yeah. Uh -huh. I'm going to say it's a great audience so that 70% of the people here take their so cat. So they kicked your butt. They're at 81%. So that oh, is- Oh man, it. I love you guys. You know what? That is awesome. And I will say it is 19% between every two to three years and only when something pops up. So the fact that we have such a broad audience here that has great respect for their veterinarians is absolutely huge and understands that value. But here comes the hard one. Ready? So what prevents you or discourages you from taking your cat to the vet? So uh, which you came, which do you think came in last place? Last place, I yeah. think probably cost is the lowest concern in most cases, especially for people who are really committed to the um, so care. Unfortunately, that was the top one. Really? Yeah. What so it went with you, the cost. Cost, it's stressful for me and my cat. So we're going to yeah, talk. That's about what I was going to say was the first one. Uh, cat carriers and all that here coming up because that's a big deal because you've got an amazing one you're going to talk about that I actually has been starting to show up in my Instagram feed that I'm like dying for. Um, and then it was the idea that there isn't a good clinic next to them or, uh, or being able to find. So I think it's really good information, but these folks are definitely committed to their pet's care and that's what we love. Mm -hmm. uh, going ahead so uh, as we're definitely doing this okay so what we want to kind of go through can we just talk about the cat carrier right now because i'm just so excited about it sure okay sure what do you want to what do you want to oh, talk about I mean, that's, it's huge. there's the new cat carrier that like pulls from the bottom right it's that's like a it's like a file cabinet drawer so it's got a big front that's the door and then you slide it out. It's a, it looks like a traditional box plastic rectangular carrier, but the, the front slides open and the cat slides out and it's got a, it's got a barrier in the back so the cat can't jump out. And, and just to back up a minute, what's really important with carriers, first of all, they, they need to be safe. Um, so they should be rigid and firm. Uh, Sleepy Pod has some great carriers and they're soft, but the, the ones that are best are that we can, don't have to drag the cat out of or dump the cat out of. So I can't even begin to think of how many carriers we take apart a, a day. I'm going like this because it's unscrew the, the screws from around the sides of the carrier. Um, but I'm really eager to see a cat come in and one of those, I call them a file cabinet drawer carrier. We know what they're called because even Cindy asked that in the chat. She's like, what are they called? Does anyone know? Do you know, Shannon, that maybe you might be able to find it? Um, I, I forget the actual name, but I know they've been all over social media and I will put a link in right now so you guys can I know that it. They're um, made by House Panther, I know is the brand, but. So um, Kate Benjamin on, on House Panther, she yes. has. She featured it on, on her platform that she's a great cat person. And, um, what it's called. and yeah. um, so it's been around. Has anybody, we just got one, says yeah. Leslie. Haven't used it. They're so it. cool. Yeah. Okay. Like where were those back and in What does that do differently days? for the cat? So let's go through some of the cat strain that we're putting them in and that's causing this to be such an, a big issue for, for uh, cat parents. What, what, why they need to have it. So this is my tip with carriers. Um, carrier comfort is, this is one of my three tips and carrier comfort um, is so important. And basically it's leave it out, make it cozy. So it's a normal place to hide and ride. Um, you, you don't wanna be keeping the carrier in a closet and then get it out. Oh, and I got it out three days before. So the cat would be used to it. Yeah, they know, they know exactly what you're doing. So um, leave it out all the time, make it be a place that they can hide. Um, use the feline facial pheromone, feel away is amazing. The scent hormones, use that daily and make sure you let it air out about a half an hour before putting a cat into it. Um, certainly handling the cat to get them in, but the most important thing is get them used to it. So that's my tip is carrier comfort. I love that. 
So we mentioned litter boxes and it's popped up a couple times here in the chat I'm already seeing. Is there a litter box that you also recommend for pet parents as their? Well, a, a type of litter box, it should be big enough. So many of them are pretty small. I mean, if you think about going into a porta potty that's like very narrow and sometimes um, doesn't have the nicest scent. So that's a really good analogy. The bigger it is, the more comfortable the cat's going going to be going into it. Um, we recommend using without a hood. I know a lot of people use hoods, but it depends on the cat. Um, high sides tend to, at least three of the four sides being high or three of the four sides being high so that if they tend to lift up a little bit when they're urinating, it doesn't go over, they don't scratch the litter out. Um, but wide enough, big enough, high enough um, are the best when they get older. Uh, it's really helpful to cut one side down or have a low en entry door so that the older cat, which is often arthritic but not recognized, um, can get into the into the litter box easily. So someone asked about the uh, robot litters, those those uh, litter robots. What do you think of those? You know, there are all kinds of automatic contraptions, and I'll, it's all about getting the cat used to something early on. Habituation is, is I think the proper word for getting them acclimated and, and so that it's not a scary place. If, if you wanna get a robo litter box, this big circular looks like a giant eyeball with an opening at the end and then it rotates when the cat gets out so that the litter sifts. Um, and your cat's a little bit of a scaredy cat, it, probably not going to use it. Um, on the other hand, if you get a kitten and you have one of those scraping litter, you know, after the cat gets out in 30 seconds, it clears, it, it rakes the, the litter. Um, I really think if you scoop it every day, it's not a big deal. It's a whole heck of a lot less expensive. And the bonus on that is then you know, oh, Freddie has urine balls that are this big. Yeah. Cat Stanley, on the other hand, likes to urinate on um, under pads. So I know my cats and I know what I have to do and, and then I'm not gonna know what's abnormal. So where should we be, is there, oh, well, now where should we be putting the litter boxes? And the question that we've never asked, where shouldn't we be putting litter boxes? Ah, so that, that's, a, a, that's a good thing to ask because the shouldn'ts are anywhere a cat could get scared like loud noises, for example, furnaces that click on when it starts to get cold, or washer and dryers. So many people want to put the litter pan. I'm sure so many people, many people on this call might have a litter pan near their washer and dryer or in a, in a laundry room. And if the cat is accustomed to it, it might not be scary, but those are some of the common places that, um, that they, that, that you shouldn't. The other pl the other thing to keep in mind is, do they have an escape? Especially if they're or little kids or multiple animals in the house, they aren't going to want to go back into the back of the big walk-in closet if the dog likes to corner them in there. So um, having an escape route or having the litter box placed where they could come in and go out, that's good. So in general, on all the levels, at least one. The rule of thumb for you, and you've heard it before from Dr. Pike on the Bridge Club Pets, um, number of cats plus one for the number of litter boxes. And just as a reminder, a litter box here and a litter box here, the cat thinks that's one litter box. So it's a location. Dr. Jane? Yes. Um, there's a question um, that's been posed about uh, what, are, what are your thoughts about multiple feeding locations for cats? I'm glad that person asked because it, we generally call, lump litter boxes and feeding into resources. And each cat should have its own space for its own resources. And I will counsel people with two cats so that they feed them so they don't, aren't in eyesight of each other. Because intercat conflict is pretty common and it can be unrecognized. So separate feeding stations. It doesn't have to be on separate floors, but it certainly could be. Thank you. Yeah. Any other, so I'm gonna pivot our questions, but I wanna make sure we've gotten the litter box and we've gotten uh, the food and nutrition stuff covered. I wanna make sure both Shannon and 
uh, Cheryl, if anything is popping, otherwise I'm gonna ask a question I've been dying to ask. You know, I get very excited. And we've okay. never asked this on the cat topics is we've never talked about taking care of feral cats. Can we talk a little bit about that and what, what does that entail? What should we be doing? What shouldn't we be doing? Well, so, so let's talk about terminology. And if you think about what you call feral cats, they're, we call them community cats now. And they're free roaming and may or may not be spayed. They may be in colonies, um, but they're an opportunity. Um, so feral is kind of a bad sounding word. Oh, bad word, Catherine. <laughs> Why don't I politically correct this? Community um, cats. Community cats. And then you get to think about, well, how in my community can we work together so that we can be part of the solution instead of having the county council say one thing and the cat advocates saying another. Um, when animal shelters, rescue organizations, veterinarians and citizens all work together toward common goals like community cat challenge, um, cats win. So um, one of the amazing things that came from uh, Royal Canin, who sponsors this uh, program, one, yes. and, and Cat to Vet Day, Take Your Cat to the Vet Day, they hosted um, Hannah Shaw, who's the kitten lady, for a series of weekly interviews. Um, and, and Hannah interviewed animal welfare professionals who are really making a difference. So if there's a way to put up the link to Catology, it's called, or you can just Google Hannah Shaw Catology. And oh, I think there are six videos. It's fantastic. No, I think that that's helpful. But what about, what about on that community side, outside from the government perspective or the city being engaged? And if you've got several cats that are wandering around outside, you know, your house and, and just- so Spay, neuter, return. Um, can we feed them? Can we feed them? Do you, do you want them to come up to your house? Then you will, or if, you, if not, then you can put feeding stations and work with a community where there's a colony. I'm just saying, I've got a couple neighbors that are really enjoying that. That is, that is not on our side, but I will oh, say. Oh yeah, it's a job. whole, it's a whole thing. And the, and oh, yeah. it's amazing what community people, what people will do in their community for for cats. So, so can we talk about, is there a, is there an environmental benefit for community cats? I am curious about that. Well, people get barn cats because of rodent control. So there's that. Um, you do have to think of the environment and, and some of the people who are opposed to having free roaming community cats say that the, that um, it can affect the bird population or they could be a source of toxoplasmosis for the soil. And while cats are hunters, that's normal behavior, um, that, you know, it's a controversy. And you look at a community like Portland, Oregon, where you've got the Audubon Society and um, the cat groups working together and they have catios and you can tour. I don't think this year you can have go on a catio tour to see what people have done for their own cats to keep cats safe and birds safe. And, and so there's always a way, you know, there's always a way. Which I think is, is a really cool thing. Yeah. So let's move to the happy part. Let's talk about what can we be doing and then we're gonna uh, cover off on some behavior things, but let's talk about what can we be doing to make our cats happier um, as it is Happy Cat Month. Yeah, well, um, obviously um, keeping them healthy and I just wanna make sure that I get this important tip in since cats don't advertise that they're not feeling well um, and watching what their normal routine is, the ins and the outs, how much they eat and when and eliminating, we talked about that activity. Um, an important tip for you as a cat owner is to take video clips. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about it, a picture's worth a thousand words and you have a, if you can give your veterinarian a short edited video clip to, to share, um, that might help them choose the best tests and the um, treatments. So my favorite um, example of that is the, the hairball hack. And the hairball hack is, <laughs> And then they retch. And then they might bring something up and people think, my cat has a hairball because there's a little hair in that spittle that came up. 
and when in fact it's either GI disease or even more often it's pulmonary disease. Oh so my God. when I can see that, I say, I see your cat doing that noise it's it's pulmonary it, it, and so that's a whole different pathway than somebody coming in and saying my cat has hairballs so um i would love to have a, a a full topic on hairballs and the myths around hairballs but um i think you really asked me uh what did you really ask me I, I was wondering how we can keep them happy but i do want to make sure is there another area in that category where we're talking about like at, like asthma and those types of things that we need to cover off on because we may we were supposed to maybe cover off on one of them too and we have forgot yeah well that uh environmental enrichment in the home that's yeah. where you know i wanted to make sure that cats had their separate resources feeding areas opportunities for claw scratch playing um the perches so that they can climb and be up and be safe, cat trees, um, different outlets for claw, for marking with their claws. And it's really important, you know, that's normal behavior and we need to make them want, you know, we want them to live with us on, on, on our terms. So trimming their nails, how do you start trimming their nails? Well, make it a happy thing you can start just by gently handling the toes and reward with the treat. Um, and that same goes for toothbrushing. So you can just start, as, the younger they are, the, when you do gentle handling with reward, then it goes a way long way. So that's all part of making it a positive enriched environment. Um, and start early, start often. It's no more, we used to tell people to use squirt guns to get them off the counters and, oh, yeah. and, and um, compressed air, you know, computer air. And then you think, but that's a negative, it's a negative reinforcement, right? So you got to tell them what you want them to do. So keep rewarding them on that perch that's at the edge of the dining room or, you know, between the dining room and the kitchen. Reward them. They go there, they get rewarded there, and they are so trainable it is it is amazing so are cats more food uh reward driven or is it more the 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 pheromones i mean which is more to help get those rewards so that they start to go in the directions that you'd like them to well you know they're all individuals i've i've um been able to have people um switch to using grooming as a reward and make grooming a positive um, interaction with their cat. And sometimes you can start by treating them. Um, definitely high value rewards um, are more desired, whether they're little pieces of dried fish or, you know, you gotta be careful with, with over-the-counter treats because some of them are really, really tasty. And when you give 10 three calorie treats, that's 30 calories. And that might be 15% of what their diet should be total calories should be. So work with your veterinarian, take your cat to the veterinarian and, you know, figure it out. No, I love that. I love it. What about the games? So one of the things that people have talked about during COVID and many people are starting to go back to work. So I do want to talk about the cat anxiety, but I also want to talk about if you have been playing with them and you're not going to be around more, how can we make sure that we're keeping that physical activity up for the cats as well? Well, some of it relates to their prey and hunting behavior. You can hide food with special puzzles or, or um, the, the, the new noble feeder for cats so that, so that there's that for activity. There's also a lot you can do remotely. Have a, um, a, a colleague that uses um, a camera and then a treat can be dispensed when she just connects online. And um, now there are games for cats. Uh, Willem Delventhal, Delventhal has invented iPad games for cats. And just that interaction, cat TV. One of my associates leaves her TV on for her cat and she just sits there and watches the birds um, on the TV. So um, it is all about, you know, if we can enrich them and challenge their minds and challenge their bodies, then they're gonna be happy and active and lean and healthy. Um, yeah, it's all oh, about enrichment and engagement. I love that. I've heard about that little treat shooter thingy that you can you know, do the, the camera with. So I am curious because 
Some companies have indicated employees are not going back full time. Uh, if you work, if you are not in a hospital and you uh, tend to uh, have an office job or uh, have been still home in January. So some are being told that, some are going in one week and then they're home for three weeks and then they're in a week again. But this is causing havoc on the stress of the cat, is it not? Or well, any change, now? any change is a stress to a cat, whether it's a change in your routine, their routine, going somewhere, bringing home a baby, that kind of thing. But you know what's really interesting, Catherine, and I think you and I were on the same um, um, summit call this morning with the data on acquisition of pets and how many how many cats have been acquired. It's different from the adoption myth, which is when the shelter is emptied out, but they emptied out because they all went into foster. This was new cats and dogs and um, an increase in exotics and, and smants, you know, small, uh, mammals and, and other pocket pets that people are getting more animals and the biggest percentage of the increase was in cats. So yay, that's a good news. Yeah. Good news. Here's the one thing we did learn today that we will share uh, uh, really quick and then Shannon's got some questions that she's going to share but they were talking about how consumer behavior has changed so much as a result of COVID that when COVID hit we all stockpiled yeah. all of our stuff we got a ton of extra cat food we got an extra ton of everything and then as we've now started to deplete those we've now convinced ourselves we must have a stockpile <laughs> and that we're no longer doing you know four months worth we're doing two whereas before we may have only done one uh so they're very funny about saying that our behaviors have really shifted in that we're making sure that we don't run out of anything for our pets so i found that to be fascinating did i hear that data right uh dr jane Yes, and I mean that's true with a lot of things because because you know some things you couldn't get, but nobody wanted to run out of cat food. That's for sure. <laughs> can I have three months of prednisolone? I said, I'm sorry, I can give you a month because uh, we can't get any more. Well, now we can, but it it it's been crazy. Yeah. Oh my gosh, Shannon, what do you got for us? So the first thing is we've had um, a few people ask about um, when or how do you know if adding another cat in your house is a good idea? Like, do they need a friend or that sort of yeah, thing? Yeah, that's a, I think knowing the, the personality of the cat that is alone or just recently became alone, um, more often than not, they do well. It's just they do well with a new individual, with a new cat. Um, but it is, again, providing the resources that they need and, and ability to escape from the other cat, right, um, if needed. And um, so I will often counsel people with aging cats to get a kitten. And um, very commonly, it, it energizes the cat. Not always, if, you know, the personalities have to, have to match, um, but you can shape their personalities. I agree with that, yeah, definitely. Do I have more time? <laughs> um, okay, we also um, have some people asking about vomiting in the cats. I guess, like, you know, my cat vomits occasionally. Is that normal or is that something that's concerning? How do you address that? Right. Well, here, he, here's the thing about vomiting hairballs are not normal. Um, and we know that chronic vomiting can have a cause, but it also can have an effect. So, again, monitoring the frequency. I keep a little vomit calendar or make a spreadsheet or something. And um, that will help you see a trend. I typically will say, if your cat vomits once a quarter, I don't get really worked up about it. Um, and of course, if they are vomiting hairballs, you know, the tubular things that kind of look like this, um, they, they could either have a delayed gastric emptying because, and there are different reasons for that, because cats normally groom, right? And they should normally be able to swallow that and have it pass through the whole GI tract. So if that's not happening, something is amiss. And that's where you get your veterinarian involved. So when it starts to increase to once a month or cluster vomiting, where it's several times in a week and, and then not for a month, then that suggests that there's some underlying GI disease. And in chronic inflammatory bowel disease, begets more inflammation, begets more GI disease, and it's this kind of um, non-specific spectrum from um, mild inflammatory bowel disease to severe inflammatory bowel disease to precancer to GI lymphoma. 
So those are the things that we want to address. And if we can't um, and treat, maybe it's a diet change. That's one of the first things. Check for parasites, make sure they're on parasite prevention and do a diet change and, and different GI diets, therapeutic GI diets. They've been great. That's so awesome. I love that. I love that. Um, any other that you've got on yours, Shannon? I could probably keep going, but um, we did have someone bring up CBD. I know that's a hot topic. Um, and we mentioned, you know, there's not a ton of research out there just yet, but if you want, I mean, if you want to address like how, you know, you're having clients that are giving their cats CBD or are you recommending it? We're not. And, and some veterinarians are comfortable doing that. I think um, just because cats at this stage, we need the science. I need the science as, as a scientist, as a veterinarian to set to have someone show me that there's safety, efficacy, purity. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you can't go into a grocery, a drug store or a, or a rest stop or anywhere without, or seeing billboards about CBD this and that. And it's like, who's regulating that? So right. I can't, um, and people can have anecdotal success with it. And I'm still waiting for waiting for the science. And uh, there's some companies that are, that are doing that. So with awesome. that, I do want to, I do want to just make sure that we're posting, uh, Shannon, can you post all those links that we have, uh, oh, wow. amazing resources to find, uh, cat friendly practices so that people can have that if they're looking, uh, and needing it, or if you're looking for some additional, uh, resources on the cat, you know, carrier that we're talking about the sleepy pod, et cetera, et cetera. I want to be sure. Um, I do want to, I was a little remiss on the front end. I did really want to thank our friends at Royal Canin. Uh, they did bring, uh, Dr. Jane forward for us so that we could steal her time tonight um, and really be able to have this conversation. And those of you who had joined us previously uh, know that when Royal Canin was here, they were quite kind with an extra special gift. I don't have one for you this evening, um, but I will say that if you all will continue to follow us on our uh, Facebook page, as well as uh, our YouTube, you can get access to all of our conversations as we do them. But I love when we talk about cats. I absolutely learn something new every single time, and I think it's really important. So I do want to open up real quick if anyone has any final questions, if you want to throw those in the chat before we let everyone go, because as you know, we love to make sure you don't feel that you've been uh, uh, taken advantage of too long with your time. But I have to call out a few people because I think Elizabeth's little bundle there is cracking me up. Carol, my goodness, so super cute. We had, there was a couple of others in that I was seeing as I was going through. Now they're all like dropping off on me, but we have some of the most adorable cats this evening. And I do have to just say, if you haven't turned on your camera and you want to show us your cat, now is the time to do so because we absolutely love, love, love. Um, oh, this is one final good question while we're seeing if anyone's gotten there. Coronavirus and cats. Mm. What is the latest on that? How are we, where are we at? The latest is they can get infected. Um, I had a client call last week that, that said she was um, tested positive. She was very concerned about their cat. And um, what's important to know is that cats are getting mild respiratory infections and they are not transmitting it to people. So fear not, you're not gonna get the coronavirus from your cat. Um, we're still car side at, at many practices, my practice. That means that we bring the carriers inside, the people stay out and we glove and we mask and um, we don't wash cats down or anything, but yeah, it, it, they can get infected. It's very rare. And the, the studies that have been done on just like from reference lab labs where they have serum samples for, for other things. So they've been following to see if there's any indication that they've been infected and there is no widespread um, pandemic for cats with coronavirus. So thank heavens for that. So with that, everybody, raise your glass. We're gonna do a final toast with Dr. Jane. We can't thank you enough. I can't thank Shannon and Cheryl, Dr. Cheryl for being in the chat, helping answer questions. We hope you will all come back again, but Dr. Jane, you get to do our final toast. I would love to. And thank you everyone for being here tonight. I'd like to close with three cheers for cats. Um, the first is practice tips tonight. Uh, the three tips that I shared, which was short video clips for your vet, carrier comfort, and handling the nose and the toes, you know, talking about 
getting cats and kittens acclimated to um, being handled. So those are the tips. Uh, the second cheer is cats really do take care of us. And I congratulate you all for taking care of them. And I will close with health is not just one thing. It is everything. So thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers. That's a great toast. I love that toast.